So I think we can start. Uh, so uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for participating in this new European Guanxi webinar. Um, so the topic that we're going to talk about today is the demographics of China. And basically, uh, we're going to uh, see what, what is, has been the impact on the Chinese economy uh, from the one child policy until today. Uh, so I would like to thank Alessia Migini, who kindly accepted to be our speaker here with us today. Um, for those who meet her for the first time, she is an associate professor of economic policy at the University of Eastern Piedmont, and she is also an associate senior research fellow in the Asia program of ISPI. And uh, she has also been a visiting scholar at the Department of International Business and Economics of the University of Greenwich. And she has been an economist at the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. So I think her presence with us today is very important because uh, she has also published numerous articles on, you know, Chinese economy and the expansion of Chinese companies overseas and in international academic journals. So I leave the floor to Alessia. Thank you for being here with us today. Thanks, Flavia, for the introduction and also for having me here in this uh, European Guanxi webinar series. Uh, hello to everyone and thanks for joining this session on the uh, impact of population trends on, on, on the Chinese economy overall uh, over the last, say, 40 to 50 years. Um, well, as you may know, I'm not involved directly in economic research on Chinese demography, but every economist interested in China and in Chinese, you know, uh, development uh, over time uh, is very much interested in China's demographics because this is a very important uh, factor of change uh, in the in the mechanics of growth. Uh, economic growth and also impacts a lot on the policy makers' decisions about how to deal with the changing factors of growth in China. So I think not only from a demographic point of view, economic point of view, but also uh, on the policy side, this topic is very central. So I will try to be clear, simple, not too long. And because we want to have a number of minutes devoted to, to Q&A towards the end of the day. Uh, so, but, you know, to break the ice, I would like to show two um, uh, charts, chart, one chart and one table, just to give you an idea of what we are talking about. So this is population growth in China since you know, uh, before the 1960s from uh, UN data. As you can see, the, the darker part is uh, effective data. The lighter part is uh, projections. But projections are kind of, you know, very uh, grounded in the developments of population change. So, I mean, we can rely on them. It's not, I mean, this is a variable we can rely on projections uh, almost totally, except for major changes in, you know, variables about fertility, mortality, which are not expected to happen. So uh, when you look at the downward, you know, trend in the population size uh, in China, you have million people on the left uh, hand side, as you can see, um, it is expected to be actually happening uh, uh, you know, except for major, major, very major uh, changes. So as you can see, the actually 2022 and the, the first half of 2023 has been the peak, you know, the maximum number of uh, Chinese citizens. And from this moment onwards, the overall size of Chinese population is, you know, expected and is, you know, on the decline. And, you know, the pace of decline is also very rapid. If we think that in, you know, a very rather short span of time, uh, although it may seem that 2080 or 2010 is very long, it, you know, it, uh, we will reach it very soon. 
uh, the overall size of the Chinese population will be much uh, smaller. And already, you know, according to recent projections by the UN, already in the second half of 2023, so this year, um, India will be surpassing China. So uh, this is, you know, may seem kind of a minor, not very interesting piece of news. Um, how many people are living in China, how many people are living elsewhere, and most notably in, in India in this case. But, uh, but you know, besides the demographic uh, side of the issue, the, the political implications of this are very major because China's being, you know, uh, throwing off in a sense, um, it's, uh, its size and also the capacity to become bigger and bigger economically. And now this is not going to be true anymore. So uh, they are also shuffling a little bit, reshuffling the policy uh, measures to, to, to accommodate for this major change, which is not to be reverted. Uh, and this is a, you know, a, 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 an important point. Uh, Compared to the past, we know that the one child policy was introduced and by the way, it was also not widely acknowledged as a policy. So there were very severe confrontations within the party about how to go with the one child policy, but eventually it was uh, introduced. And um, by that measure, they, uh, the, the, the government could actually, you know, uh, control the, uh, demographic growth in China. And in a way, uh, over the last, say, decade or so, um, the other way around was kind of um, considered to be kind of possible, although much more difficult than the opposite, of course. Uh, so to force, to, 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 to um, convince couples in China to have more than one and even more possibly more than two children uh, as if you know you know families and couples were you know easily convinced um, uh, but the, the truth is that you can uh, force by various you know kind of very uh, uh, special means couples not to have the second child, as we know perfectly in China, but it's very much difficult to force couples to have more than one or more than two. And even the party in China couldn't manage to do this. Uh, but there was a kind of, you know, very short span of time when indeed the party was convinced they could force people to have. Um, this is very sad uh, for them not to be able to force people to have the second and the third. And indeed, I, well, I'm not in China since COVID, of course, but uh, around 2018, 2019, when you could see uh, families with more than one kid, everybody was taking pictures because, you know, it was since very rare. <laughs> Uh, so this is to give you the flavor of, you know, a little bit of data, but also a little bit of, you know, uh, uh, insider, how, how, how this is very central to China, although it may seem something, you know, very much, you know, macro uh, of interest only to demographers or economists. This is a very central issue in China. And if we have a look at the age distribution in China over time, Sorry, this is an Italian table. I couldn't, you know, get it uh, in English, but yeah, I can tell you is this is very uh, easy to understand. Uh, this is uh, ages, years, and last row is median age. Uh, you see that the percentage of younger uh, children, uh, younger people, um, has been declining very rapidly over time since, say, if we 2000 as a threshold, uh, we see that it, it has been declining very rapidly. And now you see uh, that the percentage of children is, you know, going to be very small compared to the percentage of middle-aged 
a working age uh, people. But also this central age, so active population or working population, uh, is going to be uh, smaller than before, although you know it's not linear. But this is not something we can go into now because it's you know the demographic mechanics that works. Uh, but it's going to be on on the decline as well. And uh, the, the sum of uh, older citizens, people, so say retired, um, in within the two age uh, thresholds, sixty plus, eighty plus. It's going to increase significantly. Uh, this, just you know, as a as a note, as a side note, this age class was almost not there until you know just before 2000, because the life expectancy overall has been increasing significantly. But uh, until say 20 years ago, more so. Um, uh the, the the very old people were a minority of the Chinese population. So median age, which is the age that actually splits the overall population in half into halves. So 50% below that age and 50% above is going to increase significantly from 30 years to 50 years and this means that the the chinese population will be composed made of mainly aged either over 40 40 plus 50 plus 60 plus until 80 plus and at the same time uh, children will be uh, fewer and fewer there's no mean to have you know more uh, or a higher fertility rate so to give you a little bit of sense of the numbers of about fertility, if we take China's 2021 census results, it's been uh, computed and gathered each uh, decade, and the 2021 is the last one we can uh, we can consider, of course. And in 2020, only 12 million children were born, compared to 73 million. 10 years before, which is kind of a very massive change, drop in birth. And uh, uh, the reason for this is partly uh, economic and social, meaning even if the same number of, couple, uh, of couples in fertility age were there, uh, the increasing participation of females in the labor market and the increasing income with middle class expansion has decreased the you know willingness of couples and females altogether to have children from scratch. So even if the same number of couples in the fertility rate were there, there would in any case be a decline in birth rates. But what uh, has happened uh, besides the changing in the say uh, willingness to have uh, even one child, um, there's also an, another say number, not a small number of reasons to uh, to explain this, which is first of all. Um, the, uh, well, one is the missing women, so to say. So the gender gap, reverted gender gap that actually uh, sees China as a very peculiar country because usually there are many more mm, uh, ladies <laughs> born than men. Uh, female born than men. Now in China, it's the other way around because, of course, uh, the possibility to have only one child, uh, convinced or forced, depending on how we see it, uh, families to uh, prefer men to women. 
And so we have some four estimated 400 uh, million women altogether across 50 years time uh, who are missing. And this of course is a very important factor impacting on future birth rates because of course, you know, still, hopefully, uh, female uh, give birth to, to new, new birth. So this is a factor I'm not, not mentioned in the slides because this is another uh, component of the explanation of this, you know, uh, uh, population um, uh, evolution, but it's, uh, I suggest that you remind also about this. Uh, over the last 50 years, the Chinese population has continued to grow despite the one child policy due to a number of factors. Uh, of course, improved living conditions and increased longevity. Of course, increased longevity made population grow, uh, even if the fertility rate was made lower uh, by the one child policy. And um, also the very low or lower than now age, uh, average age of many couples, say in the 1980s, 1990s, and so on, compared to what we can see now. So it's very, uh, you know, it was very much expected that this could happen, this would happen. Um, so there's, that, shouldn't come as a surprise indeed. Uh, what makes a difference now it is what I mentioned, you know, uh, just now that the party was really convinced they could, you know, kind of manipulate the population trends uh, on the positive side as they made it on the negative side over the last 50 years. And last, this is not possible. Um, so here I wanted to include um, some more figures and numbers, give you sense. Um, it may, you know, uh, be more technical for some of you, or if you want to have, a, a, you know, a major, bigger picture of the demographic transition in China. But I still think it's important to have some some numbers and here the total fertility rate. So the average number of children per woman was just to give you an idea above six in the fifties and sixties. Hmm? Of course, except for the first half of the sixties because of the uh, great famine anyway, and rapidly declined to less than three uh, with the one child policy. Uh, you may wonder why less than three and not exactly one. It is because in the rural areas, uh, as you may know, mm, families were kind of, you know, allowed, so to say, not officially, but, you know, allowed to uh, have more than one. Uh, they had to pay fees and to, if they had more than one, but indeed, so the, the number overall on average is not one. It is a little bit uh, higher. Um, uh, and then declined between one and two after 1980. And in 2020, it was 1.28. Hmm? So if we compare uh, fertility rate in China over, over time with uh, the same number in the US and uh, in Japan, you can see that indeed the, the, the difference before in the 60s and 70s was massive. And now it's lower than in Japan and in the US, where indeed the fertility rate is already very low by international standards. And we know that you know, population are, at least would need more newborn to get, uh, to be able to sustain the, what we will see in a minute, the dependency ratio of uh, adults and, uh, and, and, and older people not working and um, with a major need to be supported by younger uh, citizens. So the, 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 the demographic transition in China was in a sense accelerated by the one child policy. It's not possible to revert it with you know, the more than one child policy. 
Uh, this is already acknowledged by the Chinese government and they are, who are facing the truth. It's not easy, I mean, well, there's no other policy except by forcing couples to have more than one uh, child. So uh, the, the bare truth is that the Chinese government needs to do something different, totally different than any option to kind of control uh, the, 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 the accelerated decline of the Chinese population. Uh, so this was a little bit of numbers about uh, the, the, the population trends, fertility, mortality, and birth rate. Now, why is it so important that population, you know, accelerated population decline in China uh, is considered by the government and also by everybody as interested in Chinese economy and also politics? Because there are many links between demography and growth everywhere in the world, always, and also in China, of course. Um, and if we compare uh, China, the, say the Chinese economic and social system altogether, not only the economic system and uh, demographics, uh, before the, 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 the demographic transition and to what it's going to become now after the, the demographic transition, um, the, the major message is the following. Um, when China started to, you know, uh, uh, develop policy, introduce policies to start their own economic development path, um, the, the benefits of this were mm, many, but the major benefits of this were um, uh, a decline in uh, the dependency ratio. So if you ever look at the, at the picture, uh, the dependency ratio, which is uh, the share of uh, either all children and uh, older people, so not working anymore, retirees, we would say if there were pension system in China, there are no pensions, so they are retired, uh, but uh, without you know, uh, an, an income, you know, they have to uh, spend out of their own savings over the working uh, life. So uh, the sum of children plus uh, older people over the active population, we call it 15 to 64 more or less, or working age population. So, so the, this share is the dependency ratio, total dependency ratio, while if you only take older people, 65 plus, over working age population, 15 to 64, that's the old age dependency ratio. So we can see from this uh, graph that uh, dependency ratios, for, uh, mostly the total one, declined dramatically over time. And dependency ratio is an important aspect of the, the burden, so to say, you know, forgive me for this word, but, you know, the burden social that uh, burden that societies must bear to be able to, you know, grow. So because we have working age, uh, citizens working, so uh, earning incomes from which they can save and they can use savings to support children, children's education, and also um, older people um, living and also, you know, uh, not welfare, but uh, medicines and so on. So uh, the overall, if, if this is true individually for single families, individual you know, households, as we can imagine, this is also true for the society as a whole. And over time, this happened and it was very rapid in a sense because you know, 50 years is very short uh, span of time. And this actually helped China. And this is indeed the reason why they introduced the one-child policy because they were concerned about um, a too rapid population increase that could, you know, 
uh, actually be a burden and a bottleneck to growth. So they decided to introduce the one child policy. This was, you know, helping China to actually uh, uh, um, in a sense accelerate their growth rates because the population was a very important factor of growth uh, in China, but the, the, the price they are now paying is that the accelerated demographic transition will be a burden and a bottleneck for future growth. Uh, this, uh, well, well, if you see the old dependency ratio here, the green dotted line has not increased a lot, right? So because uh, the, the, the most of the impact so far has been on the total dependency ratio. So the decline in fertility, uh, not so much, you know, replaced by an increasing longevity. But what is happening already is, and the projections are dramatic, is indeed a very rapid, you know, unbelievable increase in the old age dependency ratio from now onwards. Hmm? Uh, meaning that, of course, uh, 80 plus, 90 plus, who knows, are going to become in numbers a very large share of the, of the population compared to very few children and also um, less citizens in working age, uh, 15 to 64. Um, if we were in, say, societies where we have welfare, as in mostly the OECD economies, this would be totally un unsustainable because we have welfare system, meaning pension and you know subsidies, whether pension is not uh, enough. But indeed, the 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 average and the normal uh, setting is a welfare system and a pension system, where you have contributions from working age population, paying pensions to retirees, and also savings from families in fertility age, uh, paying for education for children and for their, uh, what we call a human capital accumulation. Uh, when you have a country like China without a welfare system, and very recently the uh, the party decided that the welfare system in China is too complex to implement. They were actually starting since 2010, 8, 10, and then at the end of 2016, they were um, almost convinced that a welfare system and especially a pension system was needed in China, and I can tell you because um, the former president of, when the then president, not former because two more uh, succeeded then, the, the then president of uh, the Italian Institute for Welfare, INNPS, uh, went to Beijing December 2016 to present their system, um, universal welfare system, uh, everybody is entitled to have a pension, regardless of whether they have been working or not, whether they have means or contributions or not. So it's a universal system. And this was very much, you know, in line with what China thought the Chinese dream would become. Uh, but then the implementation is so difficult and complex in a country like China that they, they started, they had pilots, uh, but eventually they gave up because it's too much, too, too much for anybody, not only for China. And the, the sad part of this story about trying, China trying to have a welfare system and a pension system is that uh, they are actually uh, now pretending they have made up their minds um, that the welfare system, say, the Western way, um, actually is the origin for laziness 
uh, in the Western societies. So they are not going for that. But the, the very truth is that they cannot handle because China is too big and it's too complex and differences between pairs of provinces are such that they cannot uh, have a system in place that actually enables people to move uh, by, by, by keeping their own contributions, um, which is totally unacceptable. I mean, if you move and you lose everything, this, this is not working. Anyway, just to make a long story short, um, the, the, the problem in China about um, population growth, population decline and aging is not per se an issue, but it is a very important issue socially and politically because there's no welfare. So people are left by themselves with, you know, a lot of uh, retirees without a pension. So the, the fewer families with fewer children uh, have to bear, have to care for uh, a number of um, older people uh, that is increasing and increasing. Um, so, uh, per se, the aging population is not a negative factor impacting on growth because without exceptions, if you can see across societies, the increasing uh, average and even median age of societies has been going along with an increasing human capital on average of societies because the, the longer you live and the more interest you have in having your children and grandchildren educated properly for you, their lives and maybe for your own if they have to help you when you are very, very old. So on average, uh, the more the, the 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 older societies become, the better it is, so to say, for human capital, education, and so on. Because of course, life is longer, so it's much 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 more interesting to invest in each individual. Um, in in African societies, there's not much interest because mortality at birth is still very high. Mortality at 10 years, mortality and life expectancy is still so low compared to other societies that investing in education is not worth because the probability to die before you get to your own, you know, title or um, graduation is so high that you know it's not worth to invest. So this is a very, I mean, very sad point, but it is very true. So aging is not negative per se. It is because, of course, people are need to be cared for if societies want to care for older people, if this is an if, of course, and as apparently every society wants to care for their, their, um, their older uh, citizens, uh, this is going to become a major issue. Um, by the way, if, as in China, which is an exception compared to other older kind of, you know, growing rich societies, uh, decides not to care for their uh, older citizens, it means that their citizens will have to care for themselves since when they are younger. So they will have to save more for retirement and this is going to be very bad for consumption and for you know, overall economic activity, because if you save, you don't consume. And if you don't consume, that, you know, the overall idea that consumption needs to be higher and higher to keep China up, it's not working. So um, um, caring for older people uh, with public policies and welfare systems it's not something only out of generosity, but it's something that helps societies and economies to, 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 to be sustainable. Uh, and, and China is not taking this, this option, but you know, decided that they don't want to have lazy people with pensions. Uh, so nobody knows what is going to happen out of this uh, very you know, uh, kind of a sharp decision by the, the, the party. And the impact on future growth uh, is now yet to be assessed because it's not very easy to understand where you know, the Chinese overall system is going, but there are two scenarios, very extreme scenarios. Um, one is if the labor surplus stops and the second, if the labor surplus persists. What is the labor surplus? It, it is the major factor for growth 
um, besides capital accumulation, so investment in a number of sectors and experts to the rest of the world, you know, very easy mechanics. Um, still in place mostly, but you know, now running out of speed because uh, money I mean, is a lot in China, but not as it was before. Um, and so uh, the, the potential for export is declining. So, I mean, this kind of uh, recipe for growth is, you know, no longer possible. And one of the factors for growth before was labor surplus, meaning a lot of labor, so a lot of uh, capacity to uh, increase production in many sectors in manufacturing uh, to foster experts, you know, uh, to, to, to very high uh, volumes. Um, now there are two, there are two different, you know, uh, uh, developments going on. One is um, the change in composition of production in China, which is less and less labor intensive because they, of course, want to have more capital intensive, more knowledge intensive, more high tech production which is of course natural over time in economies growing, but it, it's also a, a very much uh, uh, high on the agenda point by the communist party wanting to upgrade their production to high tech and to um, uh, more you know, capital intensive production. So if you want to move your country and your production composition to more capital intensive, it means that you will need less labor. Now, if labor is decre decreased, so if, if there's no more labor surplus as before, this is okay because you don't have more labor surplus. So you, you switch your composition to capital intensive and knowledge intensive, technology intensive, and then you, you, know, you get mature as an economy and so on and so forth. But if you still have labor surplus and you want to move your production to non-labor intensive activities, then you face unemployment, which is what is happening in China nowadays. So, uh, so the link between population demographics and the economy is, it's not only one, but this is a major. And in China, it gets, you know, bigger and bigger as we, we, we move on. Because, of course, we now know that there is a lot of youth unemployment um, because of many issues. One major is this one. So there's still labor surplus. But, you know, policy-wise, the, the, the aim was to switch to more capital-intensive production. So they actually accelerated this. Uh, transition from labor intensive to capital intensive and uh, technology intensive, uh, knowledge intensive goods. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, labor still needs, you know, to be employed somewhere. Uh, so if you still have, if you don't have labor surplus, if, if you don't have a labor surplus, then you need to compensate with technical progress or innovation, right? Uh, which is a way uh, a little bit happening in China, not, you know, not on massively, but, you know, a little bit. It's still, you know, incremental innovation. It's not radical innovation, which is the very major difference between, the, you know, the, type, the kind of innovation that actually can help economies to grow by themselves, radical innovation compared to incremental, which is, you know, the bits and pieces of innovation that you get from previous innovation, which is what China is very capable in, not the radical kind of innovation, which is still lacks in China. So this kind of technical progress has been implemented already, of course, in, in China 2025 and old industrial um, plans. Uh, already, you know, uh, designed since many, many years. I mean, we realized it in 2015, but already in 2006 and then eight and nine, 
they were redesigning and you know uh, um, accelerating this kind of industrial transition to more uh, to less labor intensive and more capital intensive um, sectors. Uh, if the case is indeed the labor surplus persists, then an industrial transition to capital and, and technology intensive sector creates more unemployment than what would have been there otherwise, which is unacceptable for anybody, especially for China, because you know the kind of we can call it social contract. Bear with me if I use uh, this expression for China. Uh, between the citizens and, and the party is that the party is still there because it actually is able very much capable of you know uh, increasing the, the the welfare of the population and the living standards and whatever you want to call it uh, then this is not the case anymore because unemployment means that you don't have a living and so this is of course uh, socially and especially politically unacceptable. So this um, dilemma uh, we can see in China and we cannot see elsewhere because exactly the aging societies, all you know, advanced, I mean, industrially advanced societies that actually experience this uh, longevity and aging and decline in fertility and population transition, demographic transition, actually managed to have welfare system in place and to actually help economies to become sustainable. Although we may have a lot of problems, no, no nobody denies. Uh, but still, there is a, a structure of the society and the economy altogether in place, helping countries and economies, not only societies, to 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 move on somehow. Um, avoiding the welfare system puts China in a very very difficult position because there's no alternative, other than leaving citizens by themselves, but then they will, you know, resort to increasing their own saving and jeopardize the overall aggregate uh, growth model for the future. So there's no option. What the Chinese party will come up with, considering they dismantled the idea of introducing a welfare system, I don't know. But, um, you know, the mechanics of growth, there was a pretty, well, not only one, but there's a, in development economics, you have, you know, uh, huge fields of uh, research on how growth, growth works. And it, we can refer to it as the kind of mechanics because you have factors working and you can, you know, can manipulate factors. Of course, you can invest more, you can invest less, you can uh, force people not to have the second child, child and second and third and so on. So you can do something on the mechanics to force the system to go in a direction it would not go by itself. But you cannot do, you know, what you want. And so there's a mechanics working besides uh, that you can force up to a certain point. And China has now, you know, run out of, you know, uh, options. Uh, so they have to make up their minds in a way. Um, sorry for uh, interrupting you, Alessia. I'm sorry. I just wanted to remind you that unfortunately we have a few minutes left and we probably already have some questions from okay, the audience. Okay, so, okay. So shall we take the questions? So um, another question is, can China effectively foster technical and technological progress and achieve its goal of closing the technological gap with the US by mid-century, given the impact of the demographic crisis on its material capabilities? Well, this I don't have the, um, the chart here, but I can tell you, because I worked on it today before, um, we met here, and um, this is a very specific question. And there are many answers around you. Of course, you know because you are following this. Um, the China is keeping up and accelerating innovation. This is all true, 
But if you um, look at the R&D investment, which is you know the, the most the simplest number we can see and compare by country uh, to actually um, grasp the you know the speed of innovation and the effort, the investment in innovation. And everybody knows that China has been increasing massively the, the percentage of GDP devoted to R&D, research and development. And now it is um, more than, I mean, it's been more than 2.5% and even three, which is a lot because China is big. So two, 3% of GDP is a lot. And uh, it's even more than the average of OECD countries, so it's a lot. But if you uh, split this still huge amount of investment in R&D in China into uh, applied research, research and development and basic research, you can see that the majority of this is applied research, not basic research. And we know from the science uh, all you know, scientific um, areas, subjects, that it is basic research that produces innovation. It's not applied research. And so this is a kind of a bottleneck for China because basic research needs you know, a number of, an, an innovation system which is very different from what China has now. So they are very capable in having incremental innovation, applied development and innovation, applied uh, research, but you know, the basic research part is still very, very small. So it's not impossible, but from this very tiny percentage, I think it's, I mean, in the chart, you can barely see it in, in the total you know, amount of um, uh, research and development efforts. Uh, even if this very tiny share, you know, activates massive radical innovation in the future, this is still very small. So um, I have no idea, but it's very difficult for them to to really keep up with their own ambitions. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Alexander Peron. Uh, if you want to um, light up your mic. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Alessia. Thank you for all the explanation. Hi. Really good. I have one question. Like, well, actually, two. Would it be possible, like, for a service economy kind of to develop so all this unemployment kind of gaps and stuff, they can find just more like a say more Western style service economy? And second is can also don't that try to then open more the country to more migration, let's say from Southeast Asia, from I don't know, from other countries or even Central Asia, that would be like a way to try to solve this. And then one thing you said, like the one child policy kind of allow for the growth you know, of China, but the future is kind of now a problem, no? While I guess we see in India is actually the other way around. It's like they had the kind of growth issue, like massive population, but they now will have the good consequences, no, in a way in the future, like they actually will have like a younger kind of generation. So that's kind of my, yeah, thought. Thank you. Thanks, Alexander, for the questions. Uh, all three very pertinent. Um, I'll try to be short. Uh, well, service. By the way, first half of 2023, it is services that actually are, you know, uh, helping China to to recover from from the COVID, from the lockdowns before. It's not manufacture, it's not industry sectors, but it's services. Um, in principle, this is not an issue, but if public policies and industrial policies are all on improving technological um, uh, level of industries of manufacturing. So they are not uh, focusing on services because services are, you know, kind of, well, there are of course a big share of the economy now everywhere, but the very major technological upgrading you don't have in services, although you have digitalization and so on and so forth, but you have in manufacturing. So the one that is 
that matters most for growth is in manufacturing, it's not in services. So you can have employment in services, but if you need to, I mean, if you give up the aim of, you know, a technological race with the US, if you forget about it and you care about your own younger people needing a, a job, then you invest in services and be it. But if you want to have both, that's a problem. So this is a very good question. And I think the very high on the agenda of the party right now, because they are trying to hit two different goals and they are not in synergy. Migration, well, Japan has the same issue since very many years. They are still thinking, should we consider immigration? Still, because they are scared about people arriving. Japan for cultural reasons, you know, uh, very different from China. But China is even more scared because of course they fear terrorism, you know. So Southeast Asia has a lot of Muslim communities. So forget it, forget it. They will not, they will not. So this would be a way out, but they are not going to. So far, they are, they are not going to. And India, of course, India is now, uh, you know, benefiting from the, what actually it is a curse for development because of course it's too many for, for the possibilities that the country has to feed all of them and give jobs to all of them. But still they are benefit, benefiting from this. China has benefited, but they were so scared about becoming too many because of what happened, you know, in the 60s. Um, and also because of the idea that, you know, they needed too much food and too much of everything to feed and to care for everybody that they were, you know, curbing down on growth. But now you cannot revert it back again. Now, I mean, it's aging is and one way and one direction, it's not going to, to, to be reverted back. So there will be soon next half of the year, of this year, um, India bigger than China. And this is going to you know, diverge more and more over time. So this is a fact, nobody can do anything about it. Uh, there is a, a last question. If you want to give uh, this webinar a very quick close up, Alessia, would you like to answer to this last one very quite quickly? Sure. Um, the question is considering the fact that uh, Chinese people were an important part of the European tourist economy before COVID, especially the Italian economy, um, what should we expect from this demographic decline in terms of Chinese overseas tourism opportunities? And if this will have an impact in the future? Well, actually tourism has been the most important sector in services to recover after the, 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 the last lockdown. Uh, it's most domestic flights and trips um, for many reasons, because they were already, they were still fearing and were concerned about the idea of being you know, quarantined. Uh, so they decided to travel, you know, within borders. Uh, but there was a massive increase in flights, domestic flights, uh, over the last, say, months. Uh, so tourism is going to, 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 to keep up. I think aging helps tourism. So I'm not worried about that. So tourism, I think, will, will increase, will be on the rise, unless the conditions of uh, uh, older people compared to their younger relatives in terms of savings are so severe that older people need to save more than what they do today, which is still not settled. But unless, I mean, if they, the, the government actually creates a little bit more of confidence to people saying, you can spend a little bit more, don't worry, we will care for you somehow, then 
boom, it will boom because there is a you know a mountain of savings in China under the carpet or the mattress, uh, most likely. So uh, if this you know mountain of saving is even if a, a tiny share of this is you know uh, mobilized, that's it, more than enough. But they are so scared that they are, you know, keeping for education of grandchildren, for medicines, very, very costly now. They are scared about inflation. So now we can see, you may have heard of this, you know, kind of, well, would be piece of news about, you know, Italian exports to China, ballooning for this kind of medicament. And it's cost, costs a fortune. They have to pay for it, although it's very costly for the standards. So um, th there are many items people need to pay for themselves in China. Education, welfare, pension is not there, uh, medicines and, you know, which we are a little bit cared for in our societies and they are not. So if there was a little bit of help from the government, from, from the state, from the provinces, from whoever, uh, this would be a solution, a way out. But still, there's not enough on this. Right, right. Uh, okay, so I think it could be everything for today. Thank you very much, Alessia, for being here with us and answering all the questions. Uh, Thank I think you. I think if we have other questions that our audience may like to ask you, we may probably share your email address. Sure. All right, Go ahead. awesome, awesome. So that they will know the, sure. the answer. All right, then thank you very much for everybody who joined us today. And you will see, you will be able to see this webinar registered on our YouTube channel of European Guanxi. Thanks again. Bye. Goodbye, thank you so much everyone. for the very interesting